It's March 15, 1993. Coverdale and Page's highly anticipated album is one day away from hitting record stores. A collaboration of two successful hard rock musicians, one bigger than the other of course, but nevertheless, two names that knew show business very well. Some critics, fans, and Robert Plant were puzzled as to why Jimmy Page agreed to work with David Coverdale in the first place. Unlike Page and The Firm, with Paul Rogers' career far away from his bad company Heyday, David Coverdale had a huge hit with Whitesnake's 1987 album at almost 10 million units sold, and his concert tour of 1990 brought in hard cash after 116 shows. Add in a classic rock icon with Led Zeppelin's remaster selling like There's No Tomorrow, the idea sounded great on paper. Why wouldn't Page go for it? Written and recorded in a period of two years, 1991 to 1992, the album had the expectations of the rock and roll industry and then some. The timing for the release was complicated at the end of Hair Glam Metal, the explosion of grunge, and the Metallica Guns N' Roses Hard Rock Kingdom. This music business dynamic could be compared to 1967, which like 1991, was also the year of the goat. Hippie idealism came back with flannel shirts and the resurgence of classic rock sounds with modern perspectives. Like the grandchildren of Woodstock, this was a revival, a dangerous one for actual players from that era. Many classic rock musicians were caught in the middle of being forever young or aging forefathers of the movement. Robert Tan was one of them. Let's travel back in time. This is the making of Coverdale Page. Um, also, thank you, my friends, for finally remembering my phone number. Thank you. Bye. Exclusion of uh, John Paul Jones, uh, an obvious sort of. Shut up. <laughs> no. <laughs> an obvious. Oh, it don't matter. It's just that Jonesy was busy and we're busy. Seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. Happy New Year! January 1991 began with Robert Plant playing four shows at the Town and Country Club in London. These seemed to be rescheduled from his massive 1990 tour, with a similar setlist and vibe. With 600,000 albums sold, the Manic Nirvana era came to an end. I think it was one of the early um, heavy metal bands, probably, without knowing it. You know, because when they, when we disbanded Cream, and they weren't around anymore, Led Zeppelin filled the voids, and they became the first kind of official heavy metal band. Looking at the top nine albums from 1991, what a different landscape from the previous year it was. Most of you know this, but I will just say it for reference. Metallica's Black Album at number one, Nevermind at number two. Michael Jackson's Danger is at number 3, Queen's Greatest Hits 2 at number 4 for obvious and tragic reasons, Acton Baby at number 5, Pearl Jumps 10 at number 6, Genesis Weekend Dance at number 7, 
Not their strongest work, but hey, people were hungry for the Phil Collins solo career sound. Both User Illusions albums took the number 8 and 9 spots. Guns N' Roses was bigger than ever. You can check the charts for 1991, and there's a lot of great rock guitar albums. Songwriting over shredding kept inspiration going. Lyrics were back center stage, rebelling against the man, the system, thinking outside the box, all while cashing in the profits of a mainstream counterculture. Throw in a televised war in the Middle East, and it was like 1967, all over again. A Led Zeppelin band meeting was held in January 1991 at Plants Management Headquarters. Page, Plan and Jones discussed the possibility of getting back together. Like the 1986 attempt with Tony Thompson on drums, which you can check on my Pose Up in 80 series episode 11, this 1991 intention followed a similar fate. With remasters released in late 1990, there was potential reunion money to be made. Robert Plant mentioned Faith No More's Mike Borden as drummer for the project. I did my research and the only Led Zeppelin cover Faith No More ever did was Stairway to Heaven. Page and Jones were not familiar with Faith No More, but wanted to check out their material. Just like in the 80s, Robert Plant changed his mind yet again, and that was it. Reunion plans were off the table. It's reasonable to think Jimmy was unhappy and frustrated by this. Remasters was like a second coming for the Zeppelin revival. This moment right here is what feeds the fan theory of Page working with Coverdale as a way of getting back at Robert. While it may sound logical like your typical band drama, it was more about the business opportunity and the power surrounding Coverdale and Page. Both artists were signed to Geffen Records. Musicians at this level are money-making tickets for many. Their choices and paths speak of career freedom, yes, but in the end, money always talks. Robert Plant took a couple of years off from the road to then embark on his Fate of Nations project. The MTV Unplugged thing was still a couple of years away, so to think Jimmy working with David Coverdale was a way of revenge at Robert Plant shooting down a reunion doesn't make sense time-wise. What Jimmy Page or his manager and label did achieve by doing this was sort of create a reverse psychology effect on Robert. Coverdale triggered Plant's ego and control of the post-Led Zeppelin politics. This wasn't possible in the 80s when Page looked unhealthy and lost, as opposed to Plant getting his career up and running. Once Robert scored the now on Zen riches and returned to his bigger than life rockstar persona, it seems the only way Jimmy Page got in his psyche without trying was to work with that one rock and roll singer Plant publicly referred to as cover version. David looked the part and looked like Plant. He was making money and most important, he had the willingness to work with Jimmy as opposed to Robert who played the Zeppelin love and hate relationship to the extreme, getting on Page's nerves. And I don't think Page orchestrated a psychological tactic, but we can never underestimate managers and labels thinking two steps ahead. A perfect storm was set for 1993 and the rock and roll press enjoyed every minute of it, taking sides, adding wood to the fire. The whole post Led Zeppelin career can be summed up like this. When Page moves away, Plant gets close. When Page wants a reunion, Plant leaves him hanging. Simple as that. It may sound like a toxic relationship, but after 1977, their song did not remain the same. While we understand Robert's reasons to drift apart from Zeppelin, his actions in the 90s are everything but letting go. Speaking of beef, David Coverdale had his own share of band turmoil with guitarists Mick Moody and John Sykes leaving the Whitesnake organization past their vital musical contributions. If you read the troubled history of Whitesnake's many lineups and business decisions, maybe 1983 was David's turn to see himself in the mirror and say, ain't no love in the heart of the city. Mr. Jordan, do you have something you'd like to share with the rest of the class? Yeah, don't be stupid. Stay in school. Do what Michael Jordan says. So past the failed Led Zeppelin reunion meeting, Rod McSween from ITB Promotion reached out to Jimmy Page's manager Brian Good with a proposition to collaborate with an old friend of his, David Coverdale. John Kalotner, A&R executive for Geffen Records, played a big part as well. Not only his major label resume was filled with big names, but he remained consistent throughout his career with his work famously credited on albums as John Kalotner, as a job title of its own. Kalotner was a key player in Aerosmith's Get a Grip album from 1993. He made the band re-record the album, and they agreed to work with outside songwriters. 
Five hit singles made it reach number three on album sales for 1983, and it remains Aerosmith's all-time bestseller. Kalotner was added to the Coverdale Page mix of phone calls, schedules, and persuasion. Jimmy Page agreed to meet David Coverdale in March of 1991. Their first meeting happened at the Ritz in New York. Looking like glamorous rock stars, they drove the attention of many who wondered what was going on. By the time the white video came out, our operators in the studio, the thing would come on and they'd all sing way down inside in the break, and we'd all turn around and go, yeah, that's pretty obvious, isn't yeah. it? <laughs> well, you know, the thing is that David is the only one who's pretending that it's, that it's, it, not. it's not happening. Mm. Everyone is entitled to an opinion. You know, it's very difficult because I, I personally won't be drawn into any kind of uh, verbal Wimbledon or verbal tennis match or whatever. You know, I have the greatest respect for Robert and uh, the circumstances. It's uh, much more interesting to talk about now and potential tomorrows. Well, I was home in England and I'd made one solo album called Outrider. And I was pretty desperate to make some more music because I'm very passionate about making music, both in the studio and uh, especially being able to play it live at the end of the day. And uh, I'd been wading through scores of uh, cassettes of different singers and I'm afraid I just didn't, I just couldn't get any enthusiasm for any of the well, singers I'm that I was hearing. I'm personally delighted. <laughs> And I, uh, I had a call from my manager. I guess this came in a roundabout fashion. And I think we both received individual calls. Mm. Uh, but uh, the essence of it was, how would you like to uh, work with David? And I said, I'll give it some thought. And anyway, it came to, to be that we decided to meet up in uh, New York. I'll pass you over to David here, because mm. his situation is slightly different. When I was languishing in the Bastille for a period of time, of uh, all the peripherals of rock business with uh, coming towards the end of, uh, well, going into the, uh, 1990 with Whitesnake, I had quite enough, thank you. The moose abuse had actually gotten to me. And uh, there was an assortment of reasons that I wanted to take a, a reflective period away from what is called the music business and sort out myself and if I indeed still had the passion to continue in the music business. So I had about three weeks off, then I got this call saying, do you want to sit down with him? I said, yeah, absolutely. Very, very much so. I've admired Jimmy Page for way, way beyond uh, the Led Zeppelin. We met in March, uh, the end of March in New York, where we actually stopped traffic when we went for a walk, which was a blast, and got on terrifically well, agreed and uh, really, uh, we covered a great deal in a short space of time. Uh, and the, the most important agreement would, would be that we would take everything one step at a time. It was obvious we got on very well together. The next step was to find out whether we could actually write together. So I invited Jimmy to, uh, to come up to Lake Tahoe, promising him four very complimentary seasons. And the day he arrived, it was all in one day, wasn't it, Mike? It was indeed, yeah. Let me jump in for a second. Try to avoid answering, starting an answer with well. Okay. If I keep rolling. Somebody's in for a good chin in today, yeah, Neil. They? <laughs> you know, we, we've been friends for many years, Neil. <laughs> yeah, it's all today. Well. What a way to blow the relationship, <laughs> I mean, really. Okay. All right. Uh, you like being uh, self-flagellating, don't you? Yeah. All, all of the demos uh, for the songs that we made together, I think, was the extravagant cost of $50 from Radio Shack. It was a little, uh, what they call a ghetto blast or whatever. Uh, we left the complimentary roller skates at Radio Shack and decided just to leave it stationary. Um, we, we are both accredited songwriters and both feel that the song is what is important. There are a lot of acoustic uh, guitar demos without any doubt. The original. But the first uh, number to come out of this uh, collusion between the two of us was, uh, on the very first day, was Absolution Blues. Writing sessions began at Coverdale's house in Lake Tahoe. One song was completed on the first day, which brings me to the following topic. From a songwriting and production perspective, both Coverdale and Page brought their most recent studio outputs to the table. 1989 Slip of the Tongue was Whitesnake's last album before their hiatus. It had killer guitar work by Steve Vai, but the songwriting and lyrics lacked depth. 
thus it sold 8 million copies less than White Snake's 1987. Jimmy Page had 1988's Outrider to show for, an album he toured and promoted to some extent. It had great guitar moments, but you guessed it, the songwriting and lyrics lacked depth, selling half a million copies. A good example of this was the song The Only One, co-written by Robert Plant with Jason Bonham on drums. Production-wise, this track is a mess, and despite solid guitar work by Page, it goes nowhere really, and you wonder what happened. So you see where I'm going, right? Both Coverdale and Page had blind spots in their most recent creative products, that no matter the publicity behind them, their best work was made next to all bandmates, John Sykes, Bernie Marsden, John Paul Jones, and John Bonham. The songs on their 1983 album are just a natural extension of their playing styles. Think of it as Slip of the Outrider, or Tongue Rider maybe. These names sum up their collaboration. The first song these guys wrote together was Absolution Blues. My point exactly. It sounds like both these albums to the T. It's surprising some people were confused on the final product. I mean, what were they expecting? Symphonic progressive rock? There was absolutely no conscious decision to make a Lead Snake album. Forgive me, the naked puppets, it's very American. Um, none of that. We just literally uh, finessed, but just little uh, scratch ideas that both of us would just be inspired from each other. Coverdale and Page enjoyed late night visit to Reno, more specifically on May 14, 1991. Both joined Poison for a rendition of Led Zeppelin's Rock and Roll. Just as they started to play, Jimmy moved away from the spotlight and fell to a pit. He cracked a few ribs and broke the guitar he was lent. He managed to finish the song. Jimmy played another show in Reno on May 29th, this time with a local group, the Solid Ground Band. Page was sitting at the bar. The band's guitarist was told Jimmy Page was there. He thought it was a prank at first. To his surprise, it was Jimmy who told them if the band was good, he'd stick around and play with them. A set of rock and roll standards including Chuck Berry and Elvis had Page in full jamming mode with a 1979 Fender Stratocaster. The place went from empty to packed in no time, a random moment by the guitar hero himself. A little clip. We invited, we invited a rhythm section up to give our creation life. That's it. That's it. That was about it. And God, they did it. Yeah. The album songwriting rehearsals added drummer Denny Carmasi and bassist Ricky Phillips to further work the riffs and sections. Carmasi was a drumming powerhouse. His most recent work at the time included Hart's 80s hits, White Snake's Here I Go Again 1987 radio edit single, and one song on Cinderella's Long Call Winter album. Ricky Phillips was a part of rock supergroup, Bad English. Recording for Coverdale Page started in late 1981 through 1992 at three recording studios. Little Mountain Sound Studios in Vancouver was used for rhythm tracks. Fun fact, this place was featured in Metallica's documentary on the Black Album. Next, Criteria Studios in Florida for vocals and overdubs. Several local session players were employed at this location including Lester Mendes on keyboards and Cuban musician Jorge Casas on bass. Jorge Casas was Gloria Stefan's bass player. His work was featured in Gloria's first two solo albums, and he also became a member of the Miami Sound Machine in 1987. Casas became the second Latino bass player Jimmy Page worked with after Venezuelan musician Durban La Verde for his Outrider album and tour. Jorge passed away in 2019 at the age of 69. Abbey Road Studios and Coverdale's home studio were also used as recording locations. While the album is stated to have been recorded using analog equipment, the end result seems closer to digital. Mixing engineer Mike Fraser was brought in to work on Coverdale Page. A co-production credit was given for his expertise. Fraser's engineering resume is impressive. He knows rock and roll very well. 
His 1989 to 1991 period alone has a lot of records including Blue Murder's debut, Slip of the Tongue, Poison's Flesh and Blood, Napworth's 1990 soundtrack, and ACDC's Eraser's Edge. We can trace the sound of Coverdell Page back to these albums. One of the main complaints among fans and critics has been the sound quality. Some say the mix is muddy and dated. I went back and revisited Mike Fraser's previous work in detail. My findings proved my suspicions correct, and while I'm not pointing fingers directly at him, there is a Fraser sonic influence on the record. No question. Coverdell Page made guitars and vocals huge at the expense of the rhythm section. The drums sound muffled and need more punch. This is a Led Zeppelin crime if there was ever one. Don't believe me? Go listen to 1990's Thunderstruck, mixed by Mike Fraser. If you're still not convinced, do Slip of the Tongue and then Poison's Flesh and Blood. Trying to make guitars brighter and so up front can lead a mixing engineer towards thinner sounding drums for headroom. If we look closely at Zeppelin's recordings, Jimmy worked his guitars with light and shade, thus making the drums breathe. We can be thankful when The Levy Breaks was mixed in 1971. The late 80s and 90s hard rock approach would have killed Bonham's drumming. Coverdale Page is a great album hurt by questionable mixing and production choices. Now because this was Jimmy Page with his guitar army of both electric and those weird ovation acoustic guitars, it was a tricky situation back in the early 90s trying to capture the 70s feel and stay modern. Too bad the industry was still far away from what Kevin Shirley did with the bass and drums on Black Country Communion. Now that is the sound Coverdale Page needed. So yes, the album falls flat on the low end punch. It lives up to its title though. You can appreciate those two up front. The rest of the band? Not so much. Does the album suck? No, it doesn't. It's just quite disappointing in very specific places, which is different. Instrumentally speaking, it's Jimmy's best post Led Zeppelin material. Period. The riffs, textures and solos are up there with his latter-day Led Zeppelin magic. There is great confidence and emotion in his playing. This was Jimmy's full-fledged comeback where Outrider was a rather shy attempt at his trademark Les Paul sound. So what about David Coverdale's vocals? Well, to be fair with him, he sang his heart out on these songs. While his lyrics are not quite profound nor artsy here, they work in the context they are presented. I don't think it makes sense to be too critical about it, because most hard rock albums are not exactly fine literature. They are entertainment, and that's fine. Robert Plant's Tall Cool One from 1988 is a great example of that. David Coverdale didn't try to be somebody else. He wasn't trying to be Bob Dylan nor Peter Gabriel. What you see is what you get, and his studio performance has great delivery and control. He didn't take it easy but used the best guns from his vocal arsenal. These were the last days of his high range theatrics before his voice changed forever. Seven ten seconds away, final seconds, Magic's three point attempt blocked, Pippen comes away with it, and the Chicago Bulls have won their first ever NBA championship. Bulls have learned their lessons well, they've grown up, they win a championship. The celebration has begun in the Chicago locker room. Some of the tracks from the Coverdale Page sessions remain unreleased, such as the case of Saccharin, which ironically is so much better than some of the tracks in the final selection. A heavy dose of riffing and mid-tempo crunch, it's angry Led Zeppelin without the white snake excess. Quite a shame this one didn't make the album. Coverdale's unused guitar bits were later reworked as Whitesnake's originals for their 1997 album Restless Heart, Woman Trouble Blues and Take Me Back Again kick some serious ass. This makes me think David was somewhat afraid of bringing too much of his own material to Jimmy Page. My question is why? Coverdale had hits on the charts back then where Jimmy didn't. I have no idea what the pressure of working with a famous guitar hero feels like but David should have trusted himself more. His unused ideas deserve to be in Coverdale Page. Oh wait, there's more. Coverdale's solo album River Song from the year 2000 and Whitesnake's Gonna Be Alright from 2019 are also sketches from the 1991 sessions. What the hell, David Coverdale? These songs are great. They had to be on the album. Mastering for Coverdale Page was done by Led Zeppelin remasters man himself, George Marino. The album cover was designed by award-winning graphic artist Hugh Syme. Also a musician himself, Syme designed many of the album covers for Rush, including the Starman logo. He also did the cover for Whitesnake's 1987 album, Kingdom Comes Debut, 
slip of the tongue, Warren's cherry pie, count them to extension and get a grip. Coverdale page features a merge sign which is found when two separate roadways will converge into one lane ahead. Looking at the CD booklet I couldn't help but think of presence the object and the way the merge sign was added onto random images. I'm guessing a small Led Zeppelin tribute. Working titles for the album included Legends and North and South. So I decided on a small experiment for Coverdale Page, more specifically a portion from Shake My Tree. Because the drum sound is a real issue with the album, I went ahead and added bits and pieces from a John Bonham drum outtake. Also I recorded one bass track, two rhythm guitar parts and a small lead guitar what if. Hope this gives you an idea of what the album could have been like with a Zeppelin low end punch on the drums. Here it goes. Now on to a breakdown of all 11 songs on the album. I step aside all thoughts about the drums sounding dated and Coverdale's lyrics. I embrace these songs as powerful instrumentals first, David's passionate vocals second, and third, having actually played these tracks as personal practice. There is so much depth and quality to the material, it deserves a closer look. To think this was released in the midst of grunge? Jimmy Page probably wanted to remind everyone that he was one of the forefathers of electric guitar production. Soundgarden and Alice in Chains, oh Jimmy, big time. Okay, track one, Shake My Tree. I'll say it up front, it's my favorite track on the album and well, it's no coincidence why. The opening riff was allegedly written during the 1978 rehearsals for Led Zeppelin's Centro the Outdoor. Judging by the composition, Shake My Tree has a strong influence from Presence guitar framework. Because Robert wanted to go for a new sound in 1978, this riff was probably perceived as a continuation of Nobody's Fault But Mine, Thus, it was discarded. Paul Rogers also shut down the riff during the writing sessions for The Firm back in 1984. David Coverdale, on the other hand, agreed to work this up front. I bet Robert Plant was not happy when he heard the final product. The lick that irritates me most. <laughs> Licks that irritate me most by Mrs. Coverdale's little boy. Um, when Jimmy first played the, uh, the introductory guitar riff to Shake My Tree, apart from the fact it was What's he doing? It was this blur of fantastic fingers. That's what he rejoices in that I can't copy. Because I play a bit <laughs> of it. I play a little guitar, you know, uh, but only for composition. But I do like to, uh, to think I'm a guitar stud, don't I, now and again. I go into flights of fancy when he slaps me around heartlessly <laughs> and coldly. And he actually, when we made the demo of, uh, of the song in a pre-production circumstance in Reno, Nevada, uh, I came, came in, it was my birthday, and his birthday present for me, for the rest of the day, I could say it was me playing harmonica. <laughs> and after that, it was back to him. <laughs> the style in Shake My Tree is reminiscent of Nobody's Fault But Mine. From the bass and kick drum accents to the opening guitars in unison, a sort of presence feel and attack joined forces with David's White Snake style. This is Let's Snake, White Zeppelin, Let's Snakelin. The guitar army is back and John Harris on harmonica takes this to familiar Zeppelin heights. No wonder it's the opening track. It really grabs your attention with a massive punch glued together by the extraordinary tightness of Jorge Casas on bass. Danny Carmasi channels some Bonham vibrations in here. Shake My Tree sets the bar quite high. 
Track 2, Waiting on You, has a strong chord attack by Jimmy, with multiple voicings and pop hooks around the chorus section. Coverdale delivers both high note registers next to great backing vocals by Tommy Funderburk and John Sambataro. While the song may get a bit repetitive towards the end, the track is heavy and consistent, leaning a bit more on the Whitesnake side of things. The chorus gets stuck in your head, no question. And there were all these weird ascending, descending, ascend. I'm going, oh dear. I said, that's the guitar solo, is it? That's a bit quick. <laughs> Unfortunately not, that was the hook line. And that completely and thoroughly evaded me for a while. And then one more, quite seriously, one morning I just, I think I've got this great Motown lick for uh, waiting on you. So uh, there was the silence at the other end of the phone. I said, well, I'll wait till I see you and I'll sing it. <laughs> <laughs> That's he, he lumbers himself with this Motown lick. You know, it has nothing to do with Motown. Oh, it's all this. He'll uh, still keep saying it. Listen, go on, go through no, it. No, no, he goes, go uh, no matter what you say, no matter what you do, this heart is dedicated. All that just, stuff. I just see Diana Ross. Ross. Yeah. Honest to God, I want Snap. A, a pearl necklace and a wiggly butt. <laughs> you can teach an old dog new tricks. Motown. Or the black dog can teach this new old dog uh, some tricks. Very much mm. so. It's a great learning experience working with Jimmy. Track 3, Take Me For A Little While, features the acoustic greatness of Jimmy Page reflecting on life and personal tragedies. The opening intro employs similar chords found on Zeppelin's slow section from In The Evening. It's a touching ballad and extension of Jimmy's work in Outrider with bigger sonic dimensions. His main solo comes to life with cinematic orchestral arrangements by composer Douglas Clare Fisher who was not added on the album's liner notes for some reason. I can't forget to mention this. One of the sections of the song employs a chord structure of A minor, G and F in a very similar rhythm style to Stay to Heaven. No wonder it has a subliminal effect on the Zeppelin listener. Quite a nice tribute to the past. Ah. Thank you. Take Me For A Little While was a, um, a verse and chorus sequence that I'd uh, written during the point that I was staying up at, uh, in Tahoe in the accommodation I had just down the road from David and I presented it to him the following morning and uh, what was that place called again the Sheik's Delight was it <laughs> <laughs> probably so in, in, yeah and, da and David took a grasp to the, the uh, to the mood of it immediately. And uh, I'll pass you over to David here because I mean the lyrics are quite important. What we wanted to achieve, I think, with uh, Take Me For A Little While uh, was a reflective piece. Uh, we both uh, had a great deal of tragedy and loss in our lives, certainly people extremely close to us. And the music itself lent uh, an air of sadness and reflection to me. Track four is Pride and Joy, not to be confused with Pride and Joy by Steve Ray Vaughan, it had the original title of Barbados Boogie because you guessed it. Coverdale and Page worked this one in Barbados. Its musical style is a direct reference to Physical Graffiti's Black Country Woman with added tricks from the Zeppelin folk rock repertoire. The main groove sounds like custard pie and some accents speak of Gallo's Fall and Bronard Art Stump. Page played harmonica and dulcimer on this track. A catchy tune that gets ingrained in your brain. David's vocals and rhythm guitar get things done without taking center stage. He stays away from Jimmy's lane for a celebration and return to shape and form. Track 5, Over Now, is one for the grunge fans out there. Tell me you don't picture Soundgarden playing this. David Coverdale sings about his divorce from Tony Kitane to the sound of Jimmy's drone sounding riff and clever keyboard parts in the style of Kashmir's closing section. The song is a bit linear and even employs a similar guitar motif from Pride and Joy. But don't be fooled. Page drives the song beyond the overdrive with movement and grace. Over Now uh, started off uh, one of Jimmy's crunchy, malevolent, dark uh, chord sequences and a particular groove uh, and tempo that is very appealing to me. So I took a chapter out of, of my particular life and we actually discussed because he's had the same kind of experience. Uh, when you're when your actual partner isn't all they're meant to be. And it takes a little bit of time for you to actually realize that. Okay, now to the infamous track six, Feeling Hot. I've read a lot of hate towards the song, and yes, lyrics-wise, it's a prestige exercise of Whitesnake intentions to the point of parody. But hear me out for a second. The song actually rocks. It's the album mix what makes it hard to appreciate the elements. The guitar and drum stuff is heavy, with explosive fills and ferocious hits. 
It sounds like a revamped version of Zeppelin's Wearing and Tearing. I revisited this track many times for this documentary, and to my surprise, Coverdale's vocals and backup singers make this one one of the best songs ACDC never wrote. It's not to be taken seriously, it's a heavy hitter that deserves more appreciation. Feeling Hot's one of those real fun rock and roll numbers, yeah, it's got all the energy that uh, was really there bubbling away within the writing period in those early stages. I mean, it's got all of that adrenaline pump and uh, all the way through, well, what, what once we'd finished putting it together, we were saying to each other, well, this would be a, this is, this is like the opening track when we do a live show, you know, it's just, it's got all that energy and uh, it it's a damn good track as well. Jolly, it's a jolly, jolly piece of music. You know, it simply won't let go. And a lot of the, the guitar licks and the melodies, the counter melody to the vocal, uh, I've always imagined four trumpets, trombones, you know, ba ba da da, ba 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 da da, you know, real and being driven by Gene Krupa, you know, whatever. Um, Instead, it's a guitar army. Yes, it's the Jimmy Page <laughs> brass ensemble. Track seven, Easy Does It, winks back at grunge with a single note acoustic exploration mixed with an influential electric guitar riff that speaks of Jimmy's vision. He still had it, and yes, the vocals may not be poetry, but it plays an effective role of sidekick with the right attitude for a song that could have easily fit MTV's Unplugged and Fate of Nations. This one featured Ricky Phillips on bass. Track 8, Take a Look at Yourself, was written by Paige at Coverdale's house in Lake Tahoe. It's a dangerously sappy pop song with rock embellishments that borders on syrup and cliches. This is not a musical breakthrough nor the best song from the album. It was what it was. Too much going on production wise, keyboards are a bit too high in the mix and I believe this is an average song with top notch performances. Coverdale sounds like Rod Stewart at times. You decide if that was a compliment. Ok track 9, Don't Leave Me This Way. So uh, the last one we need to uh, speak about is Whisper a Prayer for, for uh, the Dying. What about Don't Leave Me This Way? Don't Leave Me This Way. Oh, um, well, we worked on it together, you know, I came up with a cool sequence, etc. you know, but mainly, the, the most important thing about this is David's vocal was really incredible on this. The opening riff was not written by Page, but David Coverdale many years prior. We Zeppelin fans thank him for not using this until 1991. Carmasi, Casas and Lester Mendes create the perfect setting for a very special showcase, a heroic composition. I think it's the greatest 90s song Page and Plant never wrote. You can appreciate David Coverdale's exquisite vocal range from delicate whispers to heavy cries of pain, sincere pain. Where he took inspiration from remains a mystery, but this one runs deep in his artistic wounds. His high range is incredible. It sounds honest and elevates the track to modern classic status. Jimmy's electric guitar work is the greatest continuation from where Led Zeppelin stopped. He was allegedly battling a fever of 102 degrees while recording the first take, which is what we hear in the final cut. Page delivered his best lead guitar magic in a decade past 1982's Prelude. He starts slow and then shred his way to the finale surrendering to the music. This should have been the closing track for the album. Not much more you can say after this one. If this collaboration was meant to be, it was to record this magnum opus. Quite possibly, one of the finest pieces from the industry's soundtrack of 1993. Next, track 10, Absolution Blues. It starts off echoing the drone and eerie vibes of Zeppelin's In the Evening with lots of reverb and delay. Then it moves into a fast tempo hard rock delivery. It's not hard to tell this was the first song they wrote. Coverdale makes use of his classic Whitesnake chops. It's funny how his high range ad-libs and phrasing sounds like Robert Plant during Led Zeppelin's live shows from 1971. Sometimes we Zeppelin fans forget just how much Plant used them live on stage to the point of excess. Maybe Robert Plant's bashing of Coverdale was a projection of his own sentiments of his early day Zeppelin vocal style. Track 11, closing number, Whisper a Prayer for the Dying. First off, listen to System of a Down's Aerials from 2001's Toxicity and tell me it was not inspired by this song. The opening arpeggio is quite similar. Um, no, we'll pass this to David again because this is mainly a, a lyrical content. Mm. The song Whisper a Prayer for the Dying uh, was another one of the songs that came out of the, uh, the Barbados visit. Suitably horrified by the images of what for us was our first living room war. 
in the Gulf uh, on a daily basis, sitting there in the comfort of a, you know, a, a home and watching this appalling fireworks display over Baghdad and, and everything that was related, the loss, and just seeing all of things as they happened uh, really struck a lyrical chord in me. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, uh, the guitar, when it comes in with a crunch riff, is, uh, it's just like tanks to me, uh, just powering across the desert. And both of us sincerely hope that the song isn't too timely. David Coverdale sings about the Gulf War and his own reflections on mortality to great effect. Once the band comes in, is another grunge mid-tempo teaser by the master himself, Jimmy Page. They shift gears into a faster tempo with Coverdale going full white snake with some strange synthesizers behind. By this point it's quite impossible not to have ear fatigue with the album's style of mixing, but the trip is worth. Jimmy showcases guitar wizardry with a vengeance. It's scary good at the height of grunge. He set the record straight of his much questioned abilities past Led Zeppelin. This was Jimmy Page 3.0. David Coverdale share his multiple vocal personalities and maybe some Robert Plant attempts. But hey, nobody criticized John Miles for that on the Outrider Rider tour of 1988. Coverdale and Page did what they knew best and turned the volume up to 11. This is a collaboration album. A sonic blast of testosterone from the Geffen Records planet. I think of this album as Arnold Schwarzenegger's last action hero from 1993. Underappreciated and overblown for some, but once you see the magic of it, it's a great film and a great metaphor in the action movie genre. The original master tapes for Coverdale Page were destroyed during the Universal Music Group fire of 2008. So I know you guys are going to ask me on my final verdict of Coverdale Page. I will say it's one of the best hard rock albums of 1993. Revisiting my CD copy cranking up the speakers was quite an experience. I bought my copy quite late in my Zeppelin fandom, 2021 to be exact. I got it for three bucks at a record fair. Thing is, I saw it here and there over the years, but I couldn't convince myself to get it. Now, after Jimmy Page promising a new solo album for the past 30 years, I've come to appreciate the historical significance and guitar baldness of Coverdale Page. Props to drummer Denny Carmasi and bass player Jorge Casas. Their instrumental contributions of my three favorite tracks from the album elevate the compositions to timeless adventures in rock and roll. Shake My Tree, Take Me For A Little While, and Don't Leave Me This Way are my top picks. Looking at these three songs though, I get the message. It's living in the past. One is a Zeppelin riff from 1978, the other is a ballad of grief over lost friends, and the third I covered the idea from his personal archive back then. Life is a highway of the inevitable. We merge and drive until it's over. On the next episode of Pose Led Zeppelin 1990s, we'll take a look at the making of Fate of Nations and all the special performances of 1992. Thank you all my patrons and PayPal donors for your support. See you soon. Take care. Bye-bye.